G'day everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Bainbridge from Greenleft. Um, I'm here today with an interview with Kamala Emanuel, who is a Social Science Senate candidate in Queensland. Uh, g'day Kamala, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, g'day, I'm Kamala and I'm here on Jagara and Turrbal country. This is land that was never ceded and I pledge my support for the struggles for sovereignty of First Nations people all across this continent. So Kamala, can you perhaps um, just begin by telling us um, you know, why you're running and what you think some of the key issues are in this election? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks a lot, Alex. Look, I, I'm running because I want to see a socialist change in society. We're being faced with the choice really between the Labor and Liberal parties to govern, and either of them are pro-capitalist. We need something that's completely different, something that reboots the whole society so we can reorganise everything from top to bottom. Now, voting for the Socialist Alliance won't, be, won't mean that happens overnight, but it will be a vote for an idea, a vision of a world where people and the planet come before profit. So that's why I'm standing. And we want, our, we want your number one vote, um, but even if we don't get elected, that'll, it'll transfer over to the Greens. But what we want is a vote um, and even more importantly, the, the development and strengthening of a people's power movement for change. The kind of change that I'm talking about is the kind of change where everyone has a home, everyone has free health care, everyone has education, ev everyone has the access to all the things for a decent, dignified, good life um, in an inclusive society so that we can end rape and violence against women, women end discrimination, end racism, um, and restore the relationship of um, you know, the, everyone who's not First Nations with First Nations people in this country, and that we can restore the relationship between humans and the environment. Um, and that's the kind of the big picture that Socialist Alliance is putting forward. And the reason we want people's vote um, is because that sends the strongest possible message that what's on offer currently isn't good enough. Um, obviously, we'd rather see Labor get elected than the Liberals, and we'd rather see a strong vote for the Greens um, that, with preferences to Labor. But we want an even stronger vote for socialist change, where people put a number one for us that says, yes, we are ready to be building a people's power movement that can alter the, the political forces in society. Um, and instead of uh, creating the kind of society that is going further and further down the road towards fascism, further and further down the road towards uh, tearing apart our society um, and, and leaving so many people behind, we want to stop reset and solve our health problems, solve our um, social problems, solve our environmental problems. I, I wanted to ask a bit about your personal background. I think a lot of people are aware that you are a strong feminist activist and very passionate supporter of abortion rights, and that's been one of the campaigns you've been involved in for many years. But it's probably not so widely known your background. Could you just tell people, um, you know, what is the first vote that you made uh, as an adult and what was the first political action you, you participated in as a child? Oh, that's very funny. So the first vote that I gave was actually to the Fred Nile Call to Australia Party. Uh, and the, the first political action I can remember ever participating in was a protest outside the abortion clinic in Tweed Heads with my mum. So we went along to this abortion clinic because um, we were people from the, our church um, uh, said that this protest was happening. And, and at that point, I was um, very strongly anti-abortion because that was the message that I'd picked up at church. And um, I mean, to, to, kind of <laughs> to kind of try to absolve myself a little, um, when mum and I realised that, um, that the people there were just seemed to just really be wanting to angrily yell at the the women who were going into the clinic um we decided not to go back to anything like that again because we 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 didn't want to we we weren't there to be horrible to women we thought i mean it probably would have been horrible even if we were quiet and gentle and as loving as we thought we could be but um Anyway, that was so I, I didn't do it again, um, but that is my first political action, and and it and it was abortion that was the um, the deciding factor. I remember going along and asking all the different people who were handing out how to vote cards, um, yeah, but what does your candidate have to say about abortion? And to me, this speaks thoroughly to the way um, to the way religion is is being derailed by right wing forces because. 
people of good conscience, people who want to do the right thing, you know, who, who might love God or might, you know, want to love humans. And, and the, the urge to, to love babies and look after babies, I, I think, is a, is a beautiful thing. I think what, what the problem is, is where people use that um, as, as the metric for how to judge a, a whole political project and where they, you know, and I include myself as in, in the past in, in this, where you kind of forget the things like um, don't judge others lest you be judged or, or things like, um, well, I just people don't seem to, I mean, in, in the church that I grew up in, I, I, we were very strongly all about, um, all about the Bible. And when you go and have a look at the Bible, abortion's not even there. Um, but 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 I think I've I've met many many people of, of faith who um, who have an approach that's that's very much of the view that I you know it's more akin to the view that I developed which is um, you know that uh, that compassion should be the guiding thing and that um, that really a, a loving compassionate approach isn't to burden someone with a pregnancy or the care of a, a, a another human um, if they're not in a position to to actually do that well. Uh, so obviously you went you went from being a fundamentalist Christian <laughs> yes. to being a revolutionary socialist. That's right. And you went from being an anti-abortion activist to someone who actually provides abortions. That's right. Yeah. Can you explain why you why you went through this change in yourself? Yes. Well, well, uh, uh, the. I, I did grow up a you know very religious person and and um and I was very serious about about it all and I honestly I think that to 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 really follow the 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 things that I that I thought were important were um faithfulness justice and compassion and and I still think that and but I think to follow them to their real conclusion does mean being a revolutionary socialist. I mean, that's that was my experience. And and I, on on the one hand, you know, you, you don't have to be a, a, a Christian or a person of faith um, to uh, follow uh, socialist ideas. And and I, I'm I'm not now, um, but it's certainly not in contradiction with with really pursuing a, a, a serious attention to to justice, which I believe is found very deeply embedded in the Bible. Um, I, I think to pursue that to its logical conclusion, you've got to look at our society. And, you know, like if, if you believe in teachings like, um, you know, uh, the poor should be looked after, the poor, the widow, the foreigner, um, the sick, you know, this idea that, that who who gets in and who gets out on the final day, um, those who, you know, I was sick and in prison and you visited me, I was hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you clothed me, those kind of ideas, well, our society isn't living up to any of that. Our society is based on this greed and avarice, theft of our, of the wealth of the, the land and of, of working people for the for the greedy, greedy few. And and so I, I think we do need to reorganise society thoroughly so that everyone has access to the resources they need to, to live a good life. Um, and and that's, that's not what we've got now. Capitalism is the opposite of loving your neighbour. And, um, and I think that if you, or yeah, like I said, you don't have to be a person of faith to, to think this way, but if you care about justice, which I think people of faith often do, um, if you care about justice, you you have to see that we need to reorganise our society. And 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 you you look at the the um, the injustice of climate change, the threats to future generations, and and to people living in the the planet all across the planet now. Um, the people most responsible for climate change are bearing the brunt the least, and the people bearing the brunt the most. Um, were least responsible for the emissions, um, and that's thoroughly unjust, and and the the threat uh, the, to future generations even more so. I mean, religiosity is a bit of a feature of the election campaign, especially with the religiosity of of um, um, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and you know how long it's been since he's been in Hillsong, and 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 a whole lot of issues related to that. I'm wondering. I mean, you partially did cover then, but could you could you talk a little bit more about? Um, uh, 
the questions, I mean, a lot of a lot of religious people get very focused on issues like abortion, homosexuality, transgender issues, things like that. Whereas the Bible talks a lot more about things like um, you know, liberation for the poor, uh, you know, feeding your neighbor, you know, love your love your neighbor, uh, and a lot of those questions, um, which which dovetail much more in with a socialist uh, program. Um, are actually ignored by this sort of right-wing Christians. Could you perhaps just not necessarily, just uh, uh, explain a little bit more, bit more about that? Yeah, um, thanks for that. I, I actually, it, it, it's sort of funny because I'm, I, as I've said, I, I'm not a Christian now. I once was, and and it's that connection to my my former, you know, quite seriously religious person. I, I didn't call myself religious. It was I was a born again Christian, and we didn't think of ourselves as religious, just more kind of spiritual. Um, anyway, um, uh, but I, I get quite angry uh, about the hypocrisy that I see um, in in public life, where religion can be kind of paraded for for political gain, and. Um, I'm also quite livid about the people who claim to be Christians, but who um, who lock up refugees or commit other atrocities, whether it's war crimes or, or crimes against humanity, or, um, or or just the the um, anti-poor uh, policies that are pursued by Australian governments. They they make me wild particularly when carried out by people who claim to be following the person who said you should love your neighbor blessed are the poor um, and you know feed the hungry and, and house the homeless um, and and I think you know the the stories that I was brought up on and a lot of people are obviously not everyone um, about uh, even just about Jesus having been a refugee having to go to Egypt um, as a as a baby um in order to escape persecution you know the these people who might wear an amnesty badge or might you know proclaim themselves to be christian in some way or another and who are incapable of recognizing the humanity of the people who they whose lives they're destroying by locking them up um on manus or nauru or, or sticking in in detention centers in australia or having on on bridging visas or temporary protection visas with with no and inside and every you know every day living without the knowledge of when will they have security when will they be able to call themselves safe um asylum seekers need safety and sanctuary and and these are things that australia could offer so um so yes in in public life there's there are whether you look at refugee um rights and the mistreatment of refugees whether you look at um the fact that uh, poor people, people on social security benefits, um, people living with disabilities, people needing the support and solidarity of a community, um, they're, they're being denied that by, by Australian governments and, and being forced to live, being forced to live in, in the kind of poverty that just doesn't allow for people to have security and, and know that their needs will be met. And I, I really want to live in a society where we do look after one another and and i think you certainly don't have to be religious to want that um but i know i know a lot of religious people do want that and i know there are a lot of people who who have this feeling where they're they're very distressed by the religious references um that do get thrown into public life because it is so deeply in conflict with the the views that we should care about our neighbors um, and and that's really very in sync with the socialist message that that we should look after one another. And I think deep down, everyone wants the kind of society where we all contribute every we know what we can, um, and and we receive whatever we need. Talking about looking after the poor, I'm wondering if you can make some comments about welfare policy in general. But I guess in particular, um, we've just had the the situation last week where Labor Party has. Um, has decided has announced that they're not going to even review the the job seeker rate, uh, and uh, I, mean, I guess this brings up the question of why you're running a socialist on a socialist ticket and not say supporting Labor. I mean, what are, like what are the talk about welfare policy, but also address this question of um uh, you know running to the left of Labor. Look, I'll, I'll start with um with the refusal to um 
to pledge to even review um, social security payments or, um, yeah, I, I, I think, I think <sighs> Labor just seems to be able to disappoint us every every opportunity. They don't want to raise our hopes, our expectations. They, they want to raise them enough that we'll vote for them and not the Liberals. And that's it. They want to stamp out everything else. And it is so disheartening, um, even for someone like I'm, I'm pretty hardened to the, the knowledge that the Labor Party isn't the Working People's Party anymore. But it's still disheartening every time they do one of these things, because expecting people to live on, a, on an income that is well below the poverty line is just a disgrace for something that calls itself a Labor Party. That implies it's a working people's party and working people, whether we're employed or not, deserve to live a dignified life. Um, and, and so the, the kind of um, policies that we need as far as Social Security go is a policy to raise um, all Social Security payments to above the poverty line. People should be able to, whether, whether it's, you know, how we retire or um, disability support or, or sole parents um, payments or, or unemployment payments, any, anything. We, we should all be able to be guaranteed that by virtue of being part of our society, we get to be included in society, that we get to have our needs met. Well, let me, if we just finish up, if you don't mind, I want to just ask you a few, like, just sort of quick questions uh, on... Um, I guess, some of the policy positions that social science has taken to this election. So maybe you start off with climate action. What's your view? What, are your, what do you think needs to be done on climate? So we need to declare a climate emergency and treat it like an emergency. We need to um, make a rapid transition to 100% um, of our energy from renewables. We need to cut our emissions to zero within 10 years, probably sooner. Uh, and we need to go move through every sector of the economy from housing to transport to manufacturing, you name it. Um, that we need to agriculture the whole works we need to to have a, a plan for a rapid transition um uh, on the way to going beyond zero so net zero is not enough because there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already as our as the fires and floods um have revealed uh if we didn't know it before so we have to head towards zero and go beyond it so we can draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and reverse the worst of the warming that we're going to be facing and it has to be just. It has to be just. See, this is where a socialist um, plan comes in because people are going to be affected by the transition we have to make. The, the people whose jobs are affected and communities are affected, whether it be by phasing out coal and oil and gas or whether it be by, um, you know, everything that we have to do, um, particularly let's start with the fossil fuel sector because that's so glaringly obvious. Um, there needs to be a jobs guarantee Everyone currently employed in the coal, oil and gas sector needs to be guaranteed a job and guaranteed um, whatever they need for, for a transition um, to another job. So whatever training they need, whatever support they need to make a transition and be guaranteed a job so that, um, so that we stop this um, criminal uh, pitting of workers against environmental goals. And what does Social Science say about justice for First Nations people? Well, we need to negotiate new treaties with First Nations people because this colonised country has to go through a process of decolonisation. We have to we have to find the way for um, non-Aboriginal people to live in justice and peace with the First Nations of this of this place. Um, so we need to negotiate new treaties that that re yeah, that establishes a just way forward. Um, we need to end black deaths in custody. So the recommendations from the the royal commissions and all the other inquiries and inquests and reports that have that have been held, they've got to be implemented. Um, and we we need to um, raise the kind of standard of living and and social um, social well-being of First Nations people. So there needs to be. Um, specific specialised programs led by First Nations people um, to deliver um, what the communities need in terms of education, housing, healthcare uh, and, and, and everything else. Housing is a big issue. What do you say about housing? Oh, housing is a huge issue and it's getting worse. I've, I've you know, just in the cities that I've been living in, in, in the last couple of decades, it's, you, you see um, the pointy end, which is, houselessness or homelessness um, and, and there's there's the invisible 
um, you know, couch surfing and 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 housing insecurity, um, whether it's um, people who are on housing department waiting lists um, or, or people just struggling in the private rental um, and even, you know, people trying to buy a house. So every level um, there's there's hardship and, and difficulty and it doesn't have to be like this. The whole idea that housing should be delivered by the private market is just ridiculous. Not every country in the world does it like that and because not every country in the world does it like that, we can see that with public housing, um, made a priority um, and, and you so well, let's say build a million public houses um, and, uh, and and let there be and let rent be capped um, uh, so that people are no longer in housing stress at least no more than 30% of people's income and, and bring it down to 10% over time um, and basically make it possible for everyone to live in a home who wants to live in a home. Uh, raise the status of women is something that you've said before. Why do you say that? Oh, absolutely. Well, the status of women is not equal to the status of men, so we need to raise it. And there, there's um, a whole pile of different elements in in here, and it's um, cultural and economic. And I, I think that we, the way I see it, is that we can't expect um, the cultural change if we don't change the economics. So women are currently stuck in this situation where um, our incomes are less than men's for a whole lot of reasons and this feeds into um, kind of financial in, um, dependence on on male partners and I'm talking in general terms because of course not everyone lives in a you know not everyone's straight and not everyone um, you know lives in a traditional household but it, the whole thing is set up to have a kind of a, a heterosexual nuclear family um, in which the woman's, um, you know, financially dependent on her husband's, right? So, um, and yes, that's been kind of changed and diversified in lots of ways, but the economic impact is that, um, that women are second to men and it leads to things like being unable to escape uh, violent relationships because of the, the fear of the economic repercussions. Um, and it leads to, yeah, just it sort of the development and, and reinforcement of sexist ideas about women and, and the roles that women should be playing in society. And so to raise the status of women, we need to raise the economic status of women. And we need to twin that with, um, you know, with social and educational and, and cultural, um, you know, consciousness raising and awareness raising and, and, and so forth as well. Elsewhere, you've spoken out in favour of justice for Julian Assange. Can you explain why? Julian Assange is currently in prison and is awaiting, um, you know, the outcome of an extradition case to the United States. Um, the US is the real criminal, not Julian Assange. The US and its allies' um, crimes were released by, uh, were you know, revealed by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, and they've reacted by trying to shoot the messenger. Um, and, and so he's being punished for revealing their crimes. So he should not be punished. He should be freed. He should be free to come home. He should be um, not face extradition. Um, and and th that all should be, be over. Uh, you've also spoken out about the cost of living. Can you talk about, um, can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. There are two aspects to what needs to be done. One is increased wages. Um, and, and other forms of income for um, ordinary people. And the other is to control prices. So on the one hand, um, uh, so wages uh, wages need to rise and the best thing the government can do there is to um, have a pay rise for, um, for public servants and support a pay increase, uh, sorry, and, and to... to um, What's it called? Uh, to legislate, to get rid of the anti-union laws so that workers and their unions can organise to fight for wage rises. So that's the first thing. Um, and and raising like um, social security payments. Um, so, so on the one side, increase our income and on the other, control prices. And we can provide a whole lot of things publicly. Uh, so make public transport free, make... Um, 
education actually free, make healthcare actually free, and include you know include all all healthcare, so all the ancillary, allied health, dental, uh, mental health, everything. Um, it, that that should all be free. So if we had, if all those things were free, the things we need um, were free. Um, and and keep on keep on looking at step by step what else needs to be added if if it's still not enough. So so if we need to have a um a food basket uh, that that we just say okay well certain things in the food basket you know a, a household every household gets to have a certain amount of um, food that's supplied for free you know there's there's a, a, um, you know a certain amount of access to the internet or, or um, utilities um, these things could be we could just say well step by step if it hasn't been enough yet and people are still needing relief we'll just make things um, free or subsidised. Um, and and basically move towards more and more things being publicly provided. One of the, uh, I guess, very important aspects of socialism is the idea about workers and ordinary people being in control of society. And that, I think, is, I mean, a lot of the policy changes that you have suggested there would overlap with some other uh, other progressive parties, but I think it really is the socialists more than anyone else that have got this idea about a grassroots democratic transformation of society can you please talk about what that means to you? Yeah, so I was sort of referring to this at, at, at the outset. It's that we need to make a deep going change in society. In order to do do all these things that I, I was sort of talking about, the, the ruling class, the capitalists, the bosses, they don't want any of this. And everything's rigged at the moment so that they don't have to pay too much tax um, and, and and they're happy. What, what we're... Um, suggesting, and I've just realised I didn't talk about nationalising the banks and mines and I didn't talk about a whole pile of other things, but anyway, what we're suggesting um, is going to impinge on them. It's basically, if you look at the, the you know, wage, um, wages share of GDP versus profit share of GDP, they're inversely proportional. You raise one, you're, you're dipping into the other and vice versa. I mean, maybe taxes somewhere in there as well, but um, we want more tax and more wages, and and it's, it's got to come out of the profits of the, of the corporation. So the only way we can do that is if we've got power, because currently the power is not in our hands. At the moment, um, the big businesses, they're buying the political parties, you know, in, in one shape or another, and some of it's legal and some of it's not, but um, it, it doesn't matter, that's what they do. We need to have a, a new kind of a system that puts us in power, and the step towards that new kind of system because that's 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 a huge thing. That's not going to happen out of these elections. But the first step is building the kind of movement that demands these specific things, and that that makes democratic demands that that we have more power in our workplaces, more power in our communities, more power in our educational institutions, so that we get used to exercising power and control, and we get used to making decisions collectively, democratically, listening to one another and, and trying to trying to sort things out so that we can make a plan and implement it. Um, and the, the more experience we have this in, in social movements and in winning those rights to make these decisions, um, and the more we can expand the right to make decisions, um, then the closer we'll get to being able to ultimately um, establish a new form of decision making where that is where the, the institutional power is in society um, and you can call that a revolution if you like that's what I think of as the revolution I don't I'm not you know when I talk about revolution I'm not saying oh guns let's go do something violent and no it's about a transfer of power um, and hopefully peaceful um, that a transfer of power into the hands of working people and all the other oppressed people and exploited people in our society. Thank you very much, Kamala. Thanks for joining us um, today. And uh, thank you very much for the, for the time that you've given us. Um, I'd like people to please consider the, the Socialist Alliance, um, what they're offering at the time of the election. Uh, but and, and obviously, as you're aware, Green Left is going to have a lot of coverage about, about the elections coming up. So check out Green Left online for, uh, for, for more about that. 